Hello everyone, welcome to the Ginger Snaps here. My name is Steven and today I am going to be tackling a series which I will be doing a lot of reviews here and there and of course it's kind of like the summertime. So I think it's only fitting that if I'm doing a series in the summer, it's going to have to be Friday the 13th. Um, I've been wanting to do all these movies as a whole entire review uh, from the first one all the way to the 2009 release remake. Uh, I've always wanted to do them, but of course, like, I do have my own opinions on them. Some I like, some I don't. Um, there was a previous video, a two-part video that I've done, where it was me ranking the series from worst to best. And, uh, as of today, um, I, you guys already saw the one video before where I was wishing happy birthday to Jason Voorhees. I think it's only fitting that I start this off with the very first Friday the 13th, released in 1980. Now, um, first of all, let's just get this out of the way. I just really want to get this out. Sean S. Cunningham, who directed the film and financed it and whatnot, uh, he really wanted to do a slasher film to save his career, because he made a bunch of unsuccessful films, and he wanted to do a slasher film all because... He saw Halloween and how successful that was. As we all know, Halloween came out in 1978. This came out in 1980, so it was perfect timing. Um, and of course, I mean, you know, with the budget that he got from Paramount Pictures, which also we must get into right now, Paramount was signing this slasher film, an exploitation film. It was a big deal because of the fact that Paramount Pictures, obviously, as we all know, is a big movie industry and for them to sign it to do a slasher film which ultimately led to a franchise it's huge very huge um so let me get that out of the way uh first things first we are starting the movie off where it's crystal lake 1958 um now with how everything had turned out that we, we see camp counselors you know singing kumbaya or whatever like that then we see someone kind of stalking around, and that's where you hear the first... K -k 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 -k. You hear that for the first time, um, which is kind of weird because, I mean, that was never really established yet until later on in the film. So I don't know why it was being done right now. And, of course, you, we see that Camp Crystal Lake has children there. This is something you do not see ever again until the sixth installment. Now, we are treated to the killer's POV. This is not new. We've seen it in Halloween. We've seen it in Black Christmas. We've seen it in almost any fucking horror movie. Where you're in the killer's POV and you're seeing what they're seeing. Um, right off the bat, they're singing Kumbaya. And of course, you know, two of the camp counselors go off and they're going to go make out. Um, obviously, the boink. But the one thing that I noticed was that it's set in 1958, but how the count, how the counselors look, is the 80s. It's like no, that's that's definitely 1980 or 1979. That's definitely that's not 50s. They don't look like that. So you know, right off the bat, yeah. Um, of course, I can't say this much more too about the campground setting. Obviously, Halloween introduced this new thing where the killers are going to be instrumental into the franchise itself where a certain element has to be taking place to start the franchise and in, in texas chainsaw massacre we had they go on a road trip and they go and visit somewhere they're not supposed to or in halloween the killer goes to them breaking out of them the mental institution and then going to haddonfield in this one it is the kids the teenagers go to the campground which an individual or a whole town doesn't want you to doesn't want you to go. Simple enough as that is. Um, so it's a nice little setting. And of course, the campground setting is they're out of their elements when it comes to adult authority. Like the police can't save them, parents can't save them, everything like that. So it gets them away. Just and, and also at the same time, you get the killer that could be behind any tree, can be you know hit hiding in a tent, hiding in a camp or, or a camp counselor's cabin. It you know. So much that you can do with that. So that's why, and of course, you know, hiding on a beach or, you know, whatever. Um, also, off the, right off the bat, um, I 
I kind of brought this up before with someone else, and I don't think anyone sees it. I'm maybe I'm, I've never seen it. It's one of those things that I can catch with my eyes. I noticed that when they do the shot in the moon, I see the clouds moving really, 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 really fast. But there's no wind. So why are the clouds moving so rapidly fast, yet there's no fucking wind? It's just something that really kind of bothered me. Um, like I said, these kids did not look like they were from the 50s. They looked like they were from the 80s. Um, of course, with the soundtrack that we get also as well, not only was Friday the 13th ripping off Halloween, but when it came to their score, they were ripping off Psycho. You can get those little melodies of whatnot going into this film watching it and watching psycho and it's like holy shit yeah it does sound the same and, you know it's kind of weird of course then we have uh annie who comes to the town and she's wondering how to get to camp crystal lake and of course all the the townsfolk are just staring at her all awkwardly and whatnot and then you know the driver offers to give her a ride and then of course we are introduced to ralph crazy old ralph you know going to camp blood ain't ya and um that that was the other thing so we get into this exposition with the driver and annie where he's explaining the events that have happened at camp crystal lake and one of those events obviously as we all know jason drowned that was in 57 then of course we have the two camp counselors who were killed in 58 then a bunch of fires that happened and that's how they ex he explains it a bunch of fires not pinpointing exactly what's going on there now, we also have the the reopening that happened in 1961 or 62, I believe. It was one of those two years. And he says there was the, the water was bad or whatever like that. Now, here's what Uggs mean the most on this now is the fact that they called Camp Crystal Lake Camp Blood. Yet there's only two, three deaths, one drowning, and two murders. But it's called Camp Blood. I don't know, Camp Blood does not sound like, oh yeah, I, that's what we're going to call it. I would call it Camp Blood if the two counselors were killed, and the others were killed, and all the kids were killed. Then yeah, sure, I'll call it Camp Blood, whatever the fuck. But for that, the number being three, and then calling it Camp Blood, no. I maybe call it Camp Cursed Lake. I don't know, fucking something different, but that was... Not the appropriate thing to call it when there's only three fucking deaths. Um, but then, of course, we see some more camp counselors driving in, and one of them is Kevin Bacon. This is one of those things I really like the most about certain slasher films. It's always like a little treat when you have a, a, a well-established actor or actress come in and their first film or maybe a few films after their first, they're doing a slasher film and they're much huger now. I mean, like, you know, Four years after this film, we had Johnny Depp do Nightmare on Elm Street. We had Jamie Lee Curtis, who was a nobody, do Halloween. In this one, we have Kevin Bacon. Uh, later on, Jennifer Aniston in the Leprechaun franchise. Uh, Patricia Arquette in Nightmare 3. There was a lot of fucking actors who were who are big-name actors doing low-budget slasher films. And it's fucking nice to see. You know, it's like, wow, nice little step back in time. I do believe he did do Footloose before he did Friday the 13th. I have to check on that one. Uh, but yeah, you get to see him and whatnot. And, you know, it's just right off the bat. There we go. Um, they get to the camp. Here's another thing. This is a little posture thing for me. You see Steve Christie. He's chopping up wood. And he is so hunched over. That he's just <clears throat> like he's hundred dollar like dude. That's how you're gonna get fucking back problems. Like you, you obviously not chop, chopping that fucking wood at all. You're you're fucking your back up. That's for sure. I'm like fuck. How the hell are you even still fucking standing? But then again, all these kids, you know, they're supposed to be their teens and maybe Christie's in his twenties, maybe even thirties. But we all know for a fact that half these actors were definitely in their twenties. Um, then of course, you know, he's kind of getting a little creepy, creepy with Adrian King's, uh, Alice, you know, he, you know, 70s porn stash and all, you know, he just wants in her fucking pants. Um, then of course we're introduced to more of the camp counselors, just get ahead of it. Uh, one counselor gets 
almost killed by an arrow <laughs> by another camp counselor who was, you know, the practical joker. And, you know, that's a staple that's happened in the Friday the 13th franchise. Um, but anywho, let's continue on. Um, we have an officer who shows up and tells him that Ralph, like, have you guys seen him? You know, uh, he's kind of a little bit of a, no, right in the head there. But, you know, they're, they're all just fucking around, whatever the fuck. And that is the last time you see any, like, authority figure come to the camp after that. Like, I mean, I want to say Steve Christie is one of those, but the officer, he's gone. And now there's another thing that also leads into when he fucking leaves. You finally see Ralph in the kitchen pantry, yet not one single camp counselor saw him. And when you see his bike is exactly where the motorcycle goes around. I'm like, how the fuck did no one see that bike? How did the officer not see that bike? And that bike was never fucking there to begin with. So I don't want to hear people say, oh, maybe it was like later on. No, he was missing the whole fucking time. I'm pretty sure that officer would have seen him biking down the fucking road. But of course, you know, you're all doomed and, you know, just crazy around. Whatever. Um... Again, they, they mentioned Camp Blood here, and I'm like, that's not fucking Camp Blood. What the fuck? It's not Camp Blood. Um, after this, of course, we see Pamela Voorhees. Uh, <laughs> Pamela Voorhees uh, pick up Annie. Yeah, pick up Annie, and uh, it's the killer's POV. This is where you automatically get the hint right away that you you never see the killer. You never do. And, sorry, I kind of just spoiled it for you guys. But, hear me out. Uh, you see the killer's POV. You never see her, who Annie's talking to in the Jeep. You never see it. But that should have been your first hint. That's the killer. Right there. They're not even showing the fucking killer. Um, of course, she drives past Camp Crystal Lake. And then she keeps going even further. Even though Annie tells her to stop. So Annie, you know, jumps out. And she's now pursuing Annie in through the woods. And uh, if there also leads to my least favorite fucking horror movie trope of all time. When they trip over nothing. And they keep tripping. Like, I want to hear that someone's like, well, you know, she did hurt her fucking leg jumping out of the Jeep. Yeah, well, when she jumps or walks up that hill, she uses the hurt leg to boost herself. I'm like, so first of all, you're a fucking idiot. You would have just collapsed down that fucking ditch again. But whatever, but she keeps tripping. And then later on in the franchise, you're going to see this thing come up where it's teleportation. Um, the killer is chasing her from behind. And she keeps going straight. And she's, you know, thought she's out, she's in the clear. She's all good. Then all of a sudden, the killer shows up right in front of her. There's no fucking way that happened. Like, there's no fucking way. So, the seeds were already planted in this fucking film. Um, now, of course, I have to really bring up the whole, you know, her, the controversy that a lot of people have said about this film, which was they killed a real snake in this film. Uh, they do kill a, a real snake, and it's live. It's right fucking there. I mean, I don't like snakes personally, but... You know, the fact that they kill the real snake. It's like, you know, the Cannibal Holocaust where they kill the turtle, whatever. Um, but yeah, they do that. And I mean, well, no, I did kind of miss this mentioning where Steve Chrissy goes to town and he's going to come back. He wants everything to go back to work. And they want to go back to work and whatnot and get this camp reopened. Because that was the thing. The campground needed to be reopened. They're just sitting there swimming. Having fun, fucking around. It's like, wow, they're not taking their jobs fucking seriously. So, anywho, one pretends to fucking drown. Happens to be the prankster. But, needless to say, um, I can't stress this enough. Kevin Bacon's actually not really a throwaway character in this movie. If you see his acting and in, in how he is doing this film, you all see, like, he's kind of a what you would assume is a throwaway character because slasher films, all you cared about was the killer killing them. But Kevin Bacon actually puts a lot of acting chops into this where you know he's not just there to get high and get laid or whatever i mean yeah, he he gets laid and he gets high whatever but he's kind of there and it's kind of like you can kind of associate with him he's just kind of like yeah i'm camp cancer fuck it whatever but at the same time i don't mind getting to know you or you know doing my job whatever the fuck when these kids show up but whatever 
So then, of course, we get the the famous kill of the whole fucking film. Uh, Kevin Bacon, the arrow through the throat. Um, obviously, as we all know, the special effects, the tube fucked up and toss, uh, Tasso blew onto it. And then that's what caused the blood to splurt right out of there. And just kind of go every fucking where. But good effect. But now on DVD and on Blu-ray, you can actually see Kevin Bacon's actual head. And the nice little line of the prosthetic neck, which meant a whole body was made. It sucks, but I mean, like, in, on VHS and probably in the theaters, you never saw it. So then, of course, this is where now everyone starts getting picked off one by one. Here we go. The formula for the slasher genre. See, now here's the thing. Halloween did it, the body count kind of thing, which causes it to be a slasher, where he was slowly taking his time and killing people. And, of course, he only killed, I think, four or five people in that whole in the first Halloween film. So, this one, it's Friday the 13th, even though it's a ripoff, and it's it became its own fucking thing. Like, Jason Voorhees became an icon. Let's be real. Friday the 13th was always about a body count. There's a reason why Jason has over 150, 160, 170 kills. But a lot of people actually add those kills to this first film... They had this first film to those kills, and it's like, that's actually not fucking true. I'll get to that, which I already spoiled, but I'll get to that. Um, but this is where you start seeing all the camp counselors getting picked off one by one. So, I mean, if you want to watch Friday the 13th in its entirety, I'm just going to tell you right now. This is where everyone starts getting killed one by one. Um, Tom Savini did the special effects, and he's known in the world to pretty much do a lot of great horror movie special effects if i have to give you so many examples he's done some of the friday the 13th films he has done dawn of the dead he actually directed the remake of night of the living dead he's done a lot of fucking special effects for a lot of good fucking movies um i wish he did the thing but whatever can't really guess that one um anywho so in the midst of this uh adrian King's character Alice and two other camp counselors are playing Monopoly, but not just any fucking Monopoly. They're playing strip Monopoly, which leads to nothing. You know, you don't see boobies, you don't see titties, you don't see anything like that. You, no, you don't. It's just, yeah, 80s exploitation, whatever. But yeah, this is where the killer starts to, you know, kill people in more sophisticated ways, where one gets killed in the, air, the archery line. Uh, the archery field one gets killed somewhere else another person gets killed off screen but we see them later on and then of course adrian now she is there alice is trying to find all of the camp counselors the power goes out at one point and she's now trying to find everybody then she does find everybody and they're all fucking dead and then lo and behold a vehicle shows up and it's mrs Voorhees, um pamela Voorhees, who you never saw in the whole entire movie it's a new character being introduced with the last like 20 minutes of the film coming in it's like who the fuck is this person that's also another indication that there's a possibility that this person's the fucking killer but at the same time we never did see a female killer that much in any fucking horror movie we never haven't seen it that much since so and we have and betsy palmer she did a fantastic job with this but, you know, she's very blunt half the time. She was very blunt when she said she only did it to get a fucking new car. She did this move to get a new car. She thought the script was a piece of shit, whatever. But it became something of her. She got a new cult following. She got a new uh, batch of fans who, you know, every time she went to conventions, everyone was like, can you sign this or whatever. And a lot of people have actually understood her. I do too for her little problem here when she starts noticing a dead body in there. And she's even saying, like, oh, like they should have never opened this after that boy drowned. You know, his name was Jason, and he drowned because he didn't, he wasn't a good sw swimmer. And the camp counselors were having sex or making love while that young boy drowned. And it, uh, Alice is a little, you know, beside herself on this. She's like, you're, you're just all very nice, and now you're kind of laying some shit on me here. And that's when we notice that she's having a vision of her son drowning to the point where she's like, Jason's my son, and today's his birthday. And that's when you finally get it. 
she's the fucking killer. She obviously fucking snapped. And a lot of people are even saying that they understand her fucking thought process on this. Where it's like, no, I want to punish anyone who comes to this camp because of what they did to my son. But at the same time, it's like, those were different camp counselors that did that? So why are you killing the ones from, like, years later? What the fuck is your problem, lady? You're fucking, you broke. But anyway, so now she now pursues Alice, and it, it's a constant back and forth. It's like slapstick in a way where Alice, like, hits her with a, a crow, what was it, a, a fire, fire pick, a fire picker, there we go. And then she even hits her with the butt end of a gun. Uh, Pamela Voorhees is slapping the shit off her. I mean, which was also fucking weird because you just killed people with arrows, axes, knives, all this shit. And you've now resulted to slapping and choking and hair pulling? What the fuck is this? Anywho, so this goes on for a while to the point where Alice bonks her in the fucking head with the frying pan. And... Then, of course, she goes to the beach. We think She thinks it's all over. Finally, she's dead. And it's like, no, we already fucking know. She's she's going to she's gonna show up. You did not fucking kill her with that. And then, of course, yeah, boom, she shows up. So the first reveal where she gets a rifle in the uh, food pantry and now on the beach. That's four fucking times we've seen Alice get a break. And then Pamela Voorhees pretty much says, hey, surprise, bitch. And then fucking that's it. But then, of course, this is where it's the final one, because finally, after their fucking four times of fucking fighting, Alice finally kills Pamela Voorhees. She actually kills her by beheading her, cutting her head off. And then she thinks she's safe. You know, she takes the boat into the lake, and she's found in the morning by the police, and she's sitting there just drifting away on the boat, waking up from, a, a, obviously, a nice, wonderful sleep. And you got this music, this melody just going. And it's like, you, you feel resolved. You feel like, oh, yeah, it's okay. She's safe. She's safe. She's good and whatnot. And then that's when Jason fucking comes out of the water and pulls her down. That surprised so many people in the theater. That surprised a lot of people. When I was a kid and I saw that for the first time, it was like a shock. Because at first I thought, Jason's on this fucking movie. Like, I'm not going to say this right now. I'm just going to be blunt with this. Friday, this Friday the 13th film was not the first one I saw. It was part six that was the first one I saw. So I already saw the established Jason. And then having to see the first one, it's like, well, Jason's not even in this fucking movie. And then, boom, bleh, surprise, bitch. And, you know, fucking pulls her down. But then you realize it's a fucking dream. Oh, fuck, I hate it when that fucking happens. When I feel like it wasn't a fucking dream, but at the same time... They're, the officer's even saying, when she's like, well, where's the boy, Jason? The one who pulled me under the water. He's like, man, we didn't find any fucking boy. Then he's still there. And that's how the movie ends. Why didn't they just have the movie end where Jason pulls her under the water and then fade to black, t uh, end credits? You would have had your fat fucking audience just walk out of the theater like, is she dead? Like, did he actually die? So, the long belief of this is that Jason was never dead. He had witnessed his mom die. But that's later on in the whole entire franchise. And, um, you know, it's still a debate that's up to this day. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people who have weird-ass fucking theories when it comes to the Friday 13th franchise, especially with Jason. But, um, yeah, after that, that was it. The movie ends up wrapping up just like that. Um, I don't even want to say it's a cult status, because a lot of people say it's a cult classic, but... You can't really classify it as a cult classic when you have a whole franchise built on it. And you have sequel after sequel after sequel. It's not a cult classic. Like, if I want to consider something a cult classic, a cult classic would be like Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, where they never followed anything after that. So, there's that. Like, I don't consider the first Friday the 13th as a cult classic, but at the same time, it is a good film. It's just, like I said in my listings... Um, it's not really high up there for me. It, it's good, whatever. But after a while, it becomes essentially a film that's like, yeah, it's another slasher film. But it made so much money that it came out with a second one. And then the rest is history on that one, which 
I will touch up on later on. So that's it. Um, that's been my review on the Friday the 13th 1980 film. Um, of course, if I had to give it a score, uh, out of 10, uh, 6.5 I would have to give it because, I mean, like, it's memorable, but then it's not so memorable. It's got way too many flaws. The kills are great. Pamela Voorhees is an icon. Alice was a step above the rest when it comes to the final girl status. Um, but other than that, and of course, you know, it doesn't actually have Jason in what everyone knows him as. So, this has been the Ginger Snaps here. My name is Steven, and so I will check you guys out on Friday the 13th Part 2 when I review that film. Have yourselves a good day.